Welcome back as Hockey Week gets rolling. Attention all general managers. Attention all general managers. We've got deals, deals, deals. You need something that'll make a difference? Something that will get you over the top? Something that will make you a winner at Lord Stanley's Ball? Well, we've got the goods. Left wings, right wings, centers, defensemen, and don't forget those all-important goaltenders. Many players are priced to move. But you must act by Friday, April 7th at 3 p.m. This is a once-a-year final opportunity to make the right deal. So act now. Of all the deals that went down before the trade deadline, the biggest involved Pierre Turgeon and Vladimir Malakoff going to Montreal from the New York Islanders. Arik Yedugo puts his on the beat! Turgeon and Malakoff were sent to Montreal in exchange for Kirk Muller, Matthew Schneider, and Craig Darby. Turgeon's impact was immediate as he led the Habs to a 6-5 win over Quebec with a goal and two assists in its first game as a Canadian. And it didn't stop there. Digging away, gets it out, Popovic drills it, rebound in front, scores! Turgeon! Get it by the Samuelsons on this ship. But the line is buzzing, Turgeon in front! Stop! Rebound! Scores! Pierre Turgeon! Born in Quebec province, Turgeon grew up dreaming of one day playing for the Canadians. Now he had his chance. I'm coming here and, and uh, I want to make the playoff too. But uh, the thing is, what I'm going to think about is I'm going to go on the ice and do the best I can do and, and, uh, and work hard and uh, just uh, try to help the hockey team and, and, and uh, do the best I can. So uh, well, we want, I want to make the playoff, that's, well, that's for sure. With six points in his first four games, the talented center had given the Habs a lift. Case in point, the first assist on Turner Stevenson's game-winning goal against New Jersey. With the win, the Habs moved into a conference playoff spot. Montreal has won three out of four since the trade and four consecutive games at home. Meanwhile, New York City-born Matthew Schneider was stepping into his role as an Islander, rather gladly, as he responds to a question from Madison Square Garden Network's Al Troutwig. I guess I start with a reaction to this trade and, you know, how it was to leave a team like the Montreal Canadiens and come to the suburbs of a big town like this. Well, this year it was quite easy to leave. It was a tough year in Montreal. Uh, the press is very tough, as everyone knows. And On YouTube? <laughs> yeah, on everyone. And uh, we were struggling this year, and there's no question that uh, it was time for a change for me. Schneider was selected as the game's second star in his Islander debut, a 4-3 comeback win over the arch-rival Rangers. But as for his traded teammate, Kirk Muller's transition was not as smooth. The former captain of the Montreal Canadiens took four days to report to his new team. Having helped Montreal to a Stanley Cup just two years ago, Muller had considerable ties. The fact was I was shocked uh, at the trade. Um, I was caught off, off guard, and uh, basically it took me a few days to really uh, get, get adjusted, get... Uh, get my head clear and uh, uh, before I came down here. I'm living in an area where I, I, I kind of thought to myself I was going to probably retire there and finish there and live, you know, and I made that mistake. Uh, uh, I should have known better, um, you know, today to, to think that way. But with a family and everything, that's the way we, had, we were settled into the community and, and everything. So it wasn't just boom hockey, I pack up and go. It was a lot of things where with my wife and everything that we had to understand, hey, it's over and deal with it and, and move on. In his first game as an Islander, Muller's dedicated professionalism was readily apparent both on the ice and off. I won a cup in Montreal with a team that wasn't the most talented up there, but we just paid the price and worked together. And You know, this team kind of re resembles that type of club where you're going to get your, your victories by working hard. And So I think the style of, uh, you know, is, is very similar to mine. In a loss to Tampa Bay, Kirk Muller displayed the hard work that will make him very popular on Long Island. Now it's time for the Alka-Seltzer Plus Plus Minus Award update. When you got a cold and you got to get relief, you got to get Alka-Seltzer Plus Cold Medicine. Defenseman Curtis Lecician is having a banner season, as is his team, the Quebec Nordiques. With steady play at both ends, Lecician is a big plus. Owen Nolan, c'est récupéré par Forsberg, allez c'est chute, il va la tire ici, la bleue, Lecician. With just three weeks to go, Curtis Lecician leads the plus-minus pack.
The Lester Patrick Awards for Outstanding Service to Hockey in the United States have been presented since 1966 by the New York Rangers in honor of their legendary former coach and general manager, the late Lester Patrick. From the time of his arrival in 1926, Patrick did much to make hockey popular in New York and the United States. And today, his legacy continues with the prestigious award named in his honor. Recently, the Lester Patrick Awards luncheon was held in New York. The recipients included USA Hockey Executive Bob Fleming and two Americans who were actually born and raised right in New York City, not far from the bright lights of Broadway themselves. Those two New Yorkers grew up in the Hell's Kitchen section on the west side of Manhattan. Their names are Brian and Joe Mullen, and their story is an inspiration to anyone who ever wanted to play the game of hockey. As NHL fans, we first remember Joey Mullen out of Boston College with the St. Louis Blues in 1980. He soon established himself as a true goal scorer. As a Calgary Flame, Joey enjoyed a 50-goal season and helped win a Stanley Cup in 1989. In the 90s, two more Stanley Cups followed with the Pittsburgh Penguins. And this season, Joey joined hockey's elite as he became the first player born in the United States to notch 1,000 points in his career. Brother Brian, five years younger than Joe, came out of the University of Wisconsin and joined the Winnipeg Jets in 1982. With the Jets, Brian averaged 25 goals a year over five seasons. In 1987, a dream came true when Brian was traded to the New York Rangers. The former Ranger stick boy was a top performer for his hometown team. After one year in San Jose, Brian joined the New York Islanders in what would turn out to be his last season. A heart ailment that developed in 1993 eventually forced his retirement. For both brothers, the long and remarkable path to the NHL began on West 49th Street in New York and in the schoolyard across the street. When the Mullins were growing up, roller hockey was king. Roller hockey in New York City was bigger than ice hockey, and it gave us a way to play hockey all the time. If we weren't playing on the ice, uh, we were down here every day playing in, on the roller skates. And it was a way we enjoyed ourselves. Uh, nothing could get us off those skates. We, we played from 3 o'clock after school to sometimes 11 o'clock at night. In hockey circles, the Mullins were New York legends, so much so that some early exploits were recorded for posterity. Hey, Dennis, what's Brian doing up there? Hey, Brian, come on down! All right, I'll be right down. Let me put my stuff on. You'd be amazed at how many people played hockey when we were growing up. And this schoolyard here was always loaded with kids uh, just dying to play hockey. Uh, you had CYO leagues, PAL, YMCA leagues, and the kids themselves just came down after school every day and played. They loved the game. We had Madison Square Garden right down the block, and hockey was a big part of our growing up. While the boys played roller hockey in those years before inline skates, their father, Tom, worked just a couple of blocks away at Madison Square Garden. Tom Mullen was a maintenance man, and in the days of the old garden, he would work through the night putting ice down before a game. Tom Mullen's source of employment helped further some young hockey careers in big ways and small. That helped tremendously that my dad worked at Master Square Garden. And he had an in to get some sticks every now and then for us. And uh, I think that's that was part of the, the love affair with hockey, that we'd wait up for, at night for my dad to come home. He'd come home with uh, whatever sticks he could uh, come, up, come up with. Uh, sometimes they would be uh, broke and you couldn't play with them, but... Uh, you know, there'd be a big fight for the, the best stick that he came home with. While their mother, Marion, kept an eye on the boys from their apartment window, other family members were doing their part to make sure Brian and Joey stayed on the right path. My older brothers were definitely the biggest influence on me. Uh, I can't say enough about what they, they did in a, in a city like this for a guy like myself. I, you know, they showed us the way. They could have went the other way and went towards the drugs and... And, and stuff like that, but they decided that sports was the way to go, and uh, they said it's such a high standard for myself to, to keep up with that I think it pushed me a little bit to be the best player I could be. Another influence was the Rangers' Emil Francis, who helped found the old Met League that gave the boys access to ice hockey. But it was as general manager of the St. Louis Blues that Francis would sign Joey to his first pro contract. At the time, it was a bit of a risk. A small player like myself had a hard time breaking in and proving himself all the time. And as I went to college, uh, those were the knocks on me that, you know, I was small, 
Uh, they, they didn't know if I could handle the physical aspect of the game. Uh, but uh, Emil Francis, who was, used to be here with the New York Rangers, uh, remembered that I used to play against this kid, followed my college career, and uh, gave me an opportunity to play in the St. Louis organization. And uh, I think he was a man that was very influential in my uh, pro hockey career. At least one of the boys got to play for the New York Rangers. When Brian was traded back home in 1987, some family members didn't need a ticket to get into the garden to see one of New York's favorite sons. Actually, my dad and my, and my uncle were working down there, and uh, they'd be just uh, skating off the ice from uh, cleaning around the boards, and I got to play in front of my family and friends, and uh, I just, that was probably the best, best time of my whole career. That and the opportunity that both brothers had to play in the 1989 NHL All-Star Game. Brian representing the Rangers and Joey the Calgary Flames. It's a pretty wild story and uh, coming from New York and, and making it to the NHL, making it to an All-Star Game, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty proud of myself and, and my brother Joey. Next week, we'll join the Mullen brothers for a little stroll through the old neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen and learn more about their New York boyhood and their hockey past. Then we had a family live right here on the first floor. and They had lots of kids that were, uh, were our age. We used uh, to play with them. They were all great hockey players, too. Uh. Now, Brute presents the Check of the Week. Ow! Brute Active Blue. Bill Lindsay of the Florida Panthers likes to hit him high and hit him low. This time he's opting for the latter. Kevin Lowe of the New York Rangers. Check it out. For Rod Niedermeyer, played by Lowe. Oh, Lowe with his head down. Hit by Bill Lindsay. What a hit by Lindsay with Lowe looking the other way. His head down. And that's as good as it gets. California, you might think of pretty beaches and hotly contested games of volleyball. But these days, a stretch of freeway now links one of Southern California's best rivalries, the one between the Los Angeles Kings and the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim. Got a great rivalry going with the Kings right now, and it's sort of maybe 50-50 on the street in terms of what people are wearing. But uh, in the Anaheim area, we're the number one team, it appears now, because of the, the baseball problems. and. Obviously, the Rams are in limbo at the moment, so it seems that the only team that people can hang their hats on uh, are the Mighty Ducks. And I mean, we've been sold out every game this year. It's a, something like 38 straight uh, home sellouts, and uh, our fans are really supporting us 100%. Another sellout crowd was on hand at the Arrowhead Pond in Anaheim recently as the Ducks and Kings squared off. Since losing their first four games to Los Angeles last year, the Ducks have posted three wins and a tie against their freeway rivals. But this time, more than bragging rights were at stake. The Kings, in eighth place, were sitting in the final conference playoff spot with the desperate Ducks seven points behind. In this one, the Mighty Ducks were all they were quacked up to be. All Korea, Weaver, back to Korea, backhand score! Ducks can get set up in the offensive zone. They'd like to use that point, especially with Holen. Oh, what a pass. Korea intercepts. Score! 4-1, Mighty Ducks. The newcomers were now unbeaten in five against their rivals. And speaking of unbeaten, how about Mike Vernon of the Detroit Red Wings? 12-0-3 following a win over Chicago. Rebound lays there. Here's Gray. I don't know if I've ever seen Mike Vernon as quick as this. He is just as jumping around that net like a cat. Money for Trey to the board! Two nights later, the Wings became the first team to clinch a playoff spot. Tough times lately for the Edmonton Oilers. Following seven straight losses, Ron Lowe replaced George Burnett as coach of the hockey club. But life got no better as the Oilers dropped a home-and-home -home series with the San Jose Sharks by a combined score of 10-2. And finally, some excitement in Winnipeg, where the Jets doubled their record of two shorthanded goals in a game by getting four, including three in less than five minutes. Coming in one-on-one, -on -one, shoots, goal! Chance in front, Shannon stop. Another shot, they score! Another shorthanded goal. 3-0 Winnipeg. Emerson and Kachuk. Emerson to Kachuk. Score! A short-handed goal. 
Kachuk moving in with Emerson. Kachuk shoots. Scores! A short-handed goal. The fourth of the game for Winnipeg. As the old joke goes, the next time a penalty is called, the Vancouver Canucks might want to think about declining. Now it's time for the Player of the Week, brought to you by Molson Ice from Canada, the land where ice was born. Pavel Burry seems to have caught fire just as the Vancouver Canucks need him in crunch time. Five goals and two assists in three games, including a hat trick against the Mighty Ducks. Burry. Crazy shot and scores! Pavel Burry gets the hat trick goal. The Player of the Week, Vancouver's Pavel Burry. The Dominator has been less than dominating lately. Buffalo's Dominic Hoshek had his problems against the Whalers. Ran high to Carson. Beauty back. Carson waits. Shoot! Stop. Carson shoots. Saved by Hoshek. They score! Hoshek got a piece of it, but a dribble in behind him, and the Whalers lead it 3 to nothing. Allowing three goals in 25 minutes, Hoshek was pulled from a game for the first time this season. The next day, his woes continued as he yielded six to the Bruins, including the game winner in the final moments. 25 seconds left in regulation time. Sandy Moger for Boston. That's got score! Ryan Smolinski with his second goal of the game, and Boston has regained the lead. Nine goals in two games for last year's Vezina Trophy winner. Meanwhile, last year's Rookie of the Year, Martin Brodeur of New Jersey, has regained his best form in impressive fashion. Here is Graves, moving in, lifted the shot to the glass. Brodeur out of his net to spin it around. To the back it comes. Rizwa shot. That one off legs, and then another one. Boy, Brodeur has had to be active in goal, and he's been really good. With his two shutouts, Brodeur recorded back-to-back -back shutouts for the first time in the 13-year history of the New Jersey Devils. But sometimes there's just so much a goaltender can do. Tommy Soderstrom of the Islanders and Mark Fitzpatrick of Florida see some end-to-end -end action. Tommy Fitzgerald centers. Soderstrom a big stop and two Panthers collide. Quickly, the Islanders with some track. Comes to center, four on two. Here's Paul Feeds. Fakes it, gave it to Thomas. What a save by Fitzpatrick. Florida dumps it down the ice. They've got a break. Barnes comes in on Soderstrom. He is rocked. Lindsay the rebound. He scores. In a night of considerable activity, the Islanders and Panthers battled to a 2-2 tie. Tommy Soderstrom facing 43 shots in the process. That red light means it's time for top five goals. Brought to you by Calcium Ridge Tums. Sabres held up by Darren Turcotte. He's trying to spring a two-on-one. It's Nikolaisian alone on Hasek. He scores! Andre Nikolaisian. Let's watch him. He's going to get the best score in the league. A little fake to his backhand. Whoops, around to his forehand. He's able to slip it behind Murphy, taken by Chiberev, races in with Chase. Great move by Chiberev in the back, and he scores! This was a, a, a tremendous solo rush, hanging Penguin after Penguin up. Now Neuendijk breaking through. Nice moves on Rafi and scores! Oh, oh Neuendijk, what an effort. Watch what he does to Mike Rafi. Goes one way, then the other, and Mike looks down for the moment. Able to regain control. And works his way to center. Sergei Fedorov. Dance around a check. He comes to the net. He's in. He shoots. He scores. One on one. You have got to play the body with him to have any chance at all. And now down the right side. Kamnov looking again. He shoots. He scores. What a boom. His fifth of the game. What a play by Kamnov. Went to the left, tucked it back on the right. Kamnoff using a move I think most players only try in practice. Hope you enjoyed it, and take a shot with us next time as Brute presents Hockey Week.